Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Start the Year with Data, Advertising Trends to Watch in 2022. My name is Amanda Benavides, and I'm part of the marketing team here at StackAdapt. Before we get started, we just have a few housekeeping items to cover, and then we can get the webinar underway. We're happy to field any questions you might have on any of the content. Please feel free to place them in the questions area of the GoToWebinar panel. We'll address all questions at the end of our session during the Q&A. If there are any questions we're not able to address in the allotted time, we'll follow up directly after the webinar. Just a quick note, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared shortly after we end. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to our presenters today to introduce themselves. Hey everybody, this is Piers Igmanis. Uh, appreciate your time on a Wednesday. I think we have a few slides to go over today. I've had plenty of coffee, so I think we can get it done in a timely fashion. Um, this is our best attempt at a stay at home, work from home selfie slash mugshot. And I'll kick it over to Kevin to introduce himself as well. Hey everyone, <clears throat> appreciate everyone joining us today. Uh, as Piers mentioned, we've got some fun slides to go over. Uh, ranging from some of the new trends we're seeing in the programmatic space to talking about some of the upcoming opportunities in new channels to advertise in the space as well. So thank you everyone for coming out and please, as Pierce mentioned, uh, feel free to drop your questions as we go through here. We'll be looking forward to answering them at the end of the presentation. Wonderful. So this is your first introduction to us. I mean, we are a DSP within the space. Uh, I think the biggest thing to call out here is, you know, we've been growing pretty significantly year over year for pretty much the last eight years. Uh, this is pretty much stemming from our no contract, no minimum and performance retention based model. So it's pretty unique in the space and has allowed for us to grow some great clients um, and hopefully, you know, either working with your agency already or potentially working with you in the future. Right. This is the quick agenda. Definitely want to cover a few things uh, specific to new technology, but also obviously attribution and a few other headwinds that are coming up within the industry. How you can take advantage of those or incorporate those into your marketing programs and proposals to clients. And then, of course, we'll save some time at the end of the conversation just to have a quick Q&A. If anything's pressing for you, feel free to put it in the chat and we'll answer it in a timely fashion. Right. So first and foremost, analyzing the landscape. I think the biggest thing for agencies and even something that I've been trying to do with my clients is, is try and have a tough conversation this year. Um, there's a lot of things that we are facing with as an industry right now. I feel like, you know, attribution is changing every single day. Of course, we put this slide together and this deck together and Google decides to change their targeting and cookie list future as of yesterday. So we've updated this uh, presentation to include that. But essentially, you know, there's a lot of things that we really need to be advisors in the space on and have those tough conversations to create strong and lasting relationships with clients. Um, I think the biggest thing, especially from last year, is Apple's IDFA changes, the third party cookie is still in a state of flux, and there's other identifiers that are really coming to the marketplace that's going to lead to a multi-touch attribution system so if you are still relying on like a last click attribution methodology, it's probably a good time to pivot away from that. And this kind of goes into the second point of, of pushing clients out of their comfort zone, right? Like realistically, a lot of programmatic media spend is starting to shift to more branding channels, but I know everyone likes to sit in their DR focused campaigns. We wanna drive performance. We wanna look at the data and make sure that we're driving an end result or a KPI the client is looking for. And realistically, that's gonna change probably in this year and definitely in 2023 when you know it's not as easy to align with specific KPIs as measurement starts to change. So I think this is a really big year to really push your clients to some degree to test new formats, test new audiences and test new channels. Like that's one of the biggest things that's gonna help you stay top of mind, be a very valued partner to your clients. So it's not the same thing year over year in terms of your proposals and making sure they're growing you know, as they like to see fit. Right. Another thing that it's been pretty funny for me on my end, you know, I work with a lot of B2B clients, um, is talking about year over year growth, right? We're in Q1, a lot of companies are trying to digest what they did from a marketing perspective last year. And it's funny how some of my marketing, you know, correspondents are getting their year over year growth goals. And realistically, this is something that we need to have a conversation with about with our clients. 
Um, if you're coming off an industry like B2B that was working in, you know, like digital transformation and things like that, they saw an uptick in performance and then client, you know, acquisition throughout the pandemic because people had to shift to an online workforce. The, the issue with that, though, is that's not sustainable growth, right? It's one of those things when you're coming into 2022 and, you know, the pandemic, quote unquote, might be subsiding, may be here for the long term. But that consumer demand is not something that is sustainable. And that's something that we need to convey to clients when they're evaluating our marketing campaigns, because we're not going to be just plain and simple driving that same level of growth as they saw when the whole industry shifted towards like the stay from home or like pantry loading if you're CPG. All of these things, we have to level set and reset expectations for what to expect from marketing campaigns going into this year. I think an important element to also address here, uh, as we've touched on previously, is is the effect of COVID when it comes to budget placement. You know, whether it's making sure you have a fluid mindset if you're a travel agency and understanding that, you know, you may have to push campaigns. Uh, budgets may have to be reallocated based off of very specific geo-targeting, whether it's uh, here in the States or worldwide. You know, having the fluidity, understanding and having, as Pierce mentioned, transparent and direct conversations with the brands that you're working with on how are they feeling? What news are they hearing in the space? How do they think this might affect product launches or campaign launches is more important than ever. You know, you're in the same way that you want to be able to have a direct relationship with the brands you work with and the clients that you have, understanding their needs in the space and making sure that while they're operating in somewhat of a chaotic field, you're that steady, you know, guidepost for them that light, so to speak, that is calm and has a plan for the different interactions and sometimes even last second changes is important. Yeah, well said. And I think this is something you'd see in the market right now. Like if you are following any stocks, like they're getting hammered pretty quickly just because the way we're evaluating some of these high growth stocks that did see an uptick during the pandemic is starting to see a market correction. So again, this is just something we need to convey as to how the macro environment is changing and making sure we're aligning our recommendations and expectations from clients to that change. That said, you know, the digital market and advertising market is, is definitely in a healthy space, right? Like as we're seeing things change and consumers start to navigate more and more online with different streaming services or the work from home environment, you know, I'm on multiple screens for hours upon hours a day. Um, you know, that's where audiences are pivoting to, and that is where, you know, money is following them or media spend is following them, because that's where you need to be reaching your audiences. Um, and we'll touch on this a little bit with CTV, but you can see as linear placements continue to decline, you know, this is where the bulk of advertising is now navigating to. So, you know, I think this is one of the most unique times in our industry where we're finally starting to see cracks in the quote unquote walled gardens. And there's a few reasons that come behind this. I think the biggest one to call out is what Apple is trying to do with privacy. With their IS-14 changes, like they destabilized Facebook pretty significantly. A lot of their attribution was pretty reliant upon mobile data. And I think this is just, you know, Apple's marketed play where they're trying to be privacy first, but realistically making a play for advertising dollars that's going to start breaking up what we've known as, you know, the duopoly of Facebook, Google, or even the triopoly with Google, Facebook, and Amazon coming in. So I am excited to see this, you know, more competition typically leads to a better overall environment and really gives you the opportunity to test different partners because, you know, now putting all of your budget within Google is probably not the most advised tactic for a media plan. So again, fun things to come there. I think another big thing too is, we keep seeing Google showing up in the news. Obviously, they're having some antitrust issues. The more and more these antitrust lawsuits get redacted, the more information we're getting about kind of how unhealthy it was to have Google and Facebook be the leaders in the space. Um, the cookie apocalypse is definitely something that they've kind of started. And realistically, they haven't put a solid solution in place yet to address what they are trying to change. So that's something to keep an eye on for sure. And then of course, last but not least, you know, Facebook and Meta, like social advertising has been something that people have relied on for a long period of time. And I've heard from my clients and, you know, conversations within the space, that performance is very inconsistent now. So a lot of people are actually ending up taking budget away from social, 
starting to invest in programmatic and upper funnel channels. So again, I think it's healthy for the market overall where we're diversifying where we're actually putting media spend and truly evaluating the performance rather than just saying, hey, everything's in Google like it used to be a few years ago. Um, so overall, I think these are positive trends for the industry. Part of that is important to note too, that when talking about how you're targeting individuals, what abilities you have in these walled gardens or spaces like Facebook and Google is understanding that, you know, there is still a lot of disagreement on the, the way to move forward, you know, um, it, with Google's cookie apocalypse, while there's a strong focus on data privacy, you know, as of just a few days ago, there's been lawsuits of other groups that are actually suing Google to keep some of the publisher rights to keep some of this addressable cookie data and to stop them from changing. Uh, you know, Facebook is having to respond to situations where they're being called out in the public courts right now here in the States um, and are adapting their targeting capabilities based off of that, removing your access to targeting based off of some of your political leanings, some of the nonprofit and special interest groups that you might want to work with. Um, what this is causing is not only uh, a influx of poor campaign performance due to lack of targeting data, but is something that is just the, the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. You know, these companies are going to still have to go through additional situations. They're still going to probably be more restrictions on what they're doing in the future um, due to the fact that their their data isn't siloed into one group or another. So as you're looking at solutions going forward, it's important to ask yourself, how am I ensuring that my client is going to be best reaching that audience over time? And how am I addressing my full funnel approach, whether it be paid, search, programmatic, to better deliver results that keep my clients and my brands happy? Perfect. So what does this mean, right? So I, I think the biggest thing, like we're starting to see a lot of acquisitions from the, the company perspective, right? Like where the technology is, a lot of people are acquiring and consolidating. However, audiences are becoming more and more fragmented than ever, right? Like you're seeing all of these e-commerce retailers really push out their own media offerings now, like Best Buy and Home Depot was one, Lowe's was one as well. And I think these give really unique opportunities for you to test new audiences again and really understand you know, where your audience is and try and drive the best performance, right? Um, I, I think this is definitely something that we should be, you know, aware of when we're making recommendations to clients it doesn't always have to be like programmatic in the end right we want to be evaluating what's going to be the best and position you the best as an advisor to your clients right an issue with this however is as audiences become more fragmented so does reporting and attribution right so this is why i was hinting at like last click methodology or your way that you're attributing you know your performance to campaigns as we start to advertise in multiple different areas, that identity of an individual is becoming more fragmented and it's harder to track. So there are you know, proposed identity solutions. UID 2.0 is one of the bigger ones. We'll see what Google decides to do. And I do think LiveRamp is also a really big leader in this space, but realistically it's, it's just something to keep into account or keep in mind when you're building media plans. As this ad we quote says, right? you have to be very cognizant of where you're reaching audiences and make sure you're not being duplicative with your placements. Um, one, that can lead to wasted media budget. But a second thing too, that I'll, I'll touch here in a little bit, is you have to be making sure that you're not frustrating your audiences, right? I feel like we've all been there where we've been hit way too many times by a specific creative or specific brand. And that brand awareness and brand favorability can quickly shift into being you know, turned off by the brand or not wanting to do business with that brand because they just keep, like, keep hounding you. Wonderful. So upcoming trends to watch. So, you know, realistically, I think the industry has been beating this drum for connected TV for a long period of time. And I think, you know, we, also, we all have to have this point of self-reflection of where are we? You know, why are we using CTV? Why aren't we using CTV? And what are my clients thinking when it comes to TV and CTV? Realistically, it's been growing significantly year over year. And it's something that you should be including or at least proposing to clients because it's a great new format. And, you know, as linear continues to decline, this is where the majority of advertising budget has been shifting to. 
I think growth opportunity here too, when talking with your clients comes from a knowledge base standpoint with linear uh, program buying and linear TV and national ad buys being popular in the past, but not providing that, that drilled down insight on where your impressions are going. If you're hitting the right targeting audience, this blanket effect that has kind of been the norm you're seeing folks slowly transition away from the favorability of attribution of retargeting and the capabilities that CTV provides for those operating and a multi-channel DSP like ourselves uh, gives you the ability to see not only greater insights, but really make sure that the, the money that your clients are putting towards your campaigns is being spent effectively. Yeah, that's a good point, Kevin. And something else too, that if we get into the linear aspect of things, like there's been a, a lot of TV shows and you know online TV publications that have been going after Nielsen recently. Nielsen lost their MRC accreditation and Comscore is coming in to try and win that accreditation. So a lot of the time, like TV reporting, they're, they're actually under-reporting their audiences right now. So if you want a level of granularity, that linear doesn't provide like that's where ctv really comes in and you can actually reach you know a very niche audience with very effective budgets compared to having to buy an even the upfront or spend a significant amount of you know media budget that would be required for you know a linear tv buy okay. um this slide i always like to put in so this is the talc or technology adoption life cycle and you know i always try and frame this like you have to look at this from an agency perspective but you also have to look at this from your client perspective right and you know this was made pretty popular by a famous book it's called crossing the chasm which i personally love um ctv is definitely around to stay it's already crossed the chasm it's not going to be you know abandoned anytime soon but you have to evaluate where you are in the adoption and the market opportunity that you have from each stage Right. So realistically, you know, if you're an industry that's expanding, like let's use cannabis as an example, you would have potentially a first mover advantage if you were in the early adopter or early majority here, because you're able to build brand awareness, brand consideration, and brand familiarity before any other competitor really comes into the marketplace and starts buying those formats. So there is a market opportunity if you're behind on this curve. There's a few other technologies that we'll be touching here, like NFTs and blockchain technology. It's still probably in the innovator or early adopter phase, but it's definitely something to consider, right? There's a market opportunity if you're not you know, investing in CTV, and that definitely can have impact on your media plan and the growth of your client. Wonderful. Perfect. So, you know, I, I have definitely been in the shoes where I've tried to sell through CTV to a linear shop. And it's still a hard conversation, right? A lot of people are very used to their linear TV buys. And these are typically the frustrations or pain points that we run into when it comes to trying to explain that to somebody who might not be familiar with CTV, right? I think that this is something that's still extremely important. I think the internal knowledge gap is finally coming to the, to the limelight of, you know, people know what CTV is and the opportunities it presents. But finally getting people to you know, jump in with two feet is still sometimes hard to get them to do. Um, but again, something that we should be as strategic advisors, advisors to our clients pushing in the long run because it will help them long-term in terms of growth. Now, I think it's important whenever trying to identify the value of a channel like CTV, is being able to find the layman's terms, the things of a lot of your clients may have decades of experience buying in a linear space. This may be their their safe place, their their happy home, so to speak. But you know, as we've addressed earlier in this webinar, testing is important, especially with some of the emerging capabilities of kind of shifting to being able to have better insights into your campaigns. And with this. You know, the real thing that we want to make sure whenever we're working with a CTV campaign versus say linear, um, honestly, it boils down to attribution. You know, you need to be able to tell your clients deeper insights. You need to be able to apply filters, such as targeting capabilities to things. You need to make sure that the impressions that your clients are buying aren't just a blanket in a general geo area. It's actually providing them insights. You're not over stimulating people or drowning them in this bubble of you know back to back to back commercials i think we've all seen the you know uh general for example on his automotive insurance commercials that you see in the same commercial 
on all nine commercials throughout a, a single episode of a show or maybe a basketball game. You know, CTV does provide that opportunity to control that frequency and better zero in not only on when people are watching um, or where, but also how they're watching. You know, audiences, especially for say some of your mobile campaigns, whether it be a delivery app or potentially you know a new medical device, is going to be more important than say you know trying to target someone in between the newest episodes of Nickelodeon. So when talking with your clients, make sure they understand that you know while CTV may sound new, there's quite a few benefits of it, not only from uh, addressable audiences to campaign performance that come with utilizing this format. Yeah, I think something else to add here as well is like, make sure the attribution that you're proposing to clients makes sense for the format and position within the funnel that you're trying to advertise and, and go for. I think, you know, the QR scan is something that they're trying to push through on CTV to drive almost some DR metrics. However, if you look at like how consumers are, again, their attention spans are fragmented, right? Like I'm guilty of it too, of multiple devices. I'm watching TV, I have my laptop up or I'm on my phone. For a QR code to work, like your creative has to be good enough to capture my attention one, but I also have to stop what I'm doing on my phone to take it out and scan your QR code. And realistically, if I'm in the middle of some content, whether that be TikTok or social media, doom scrolling, like that's something that's definitely hard to get somebody to do. So again, just make sure you're aware of that and make sure you're setting up great expectations for the format. It'll always make it look great when you're talking about reporting and attribution and even KPIs to make sure you've set yourself up to for success with the actual attribution and KPIs you've agreed to based upon the format. Well said, well said. I do think the, the big thing also looking forward is, you know, when trying to kind of lead the horse to water, so to speak, you need to be able to provide a vision for the future. You know, whether this is the expansion of being able to reach more people in their homes, uh, explaining the concept of being able to predict some of the future trends, whether it's the expansion of streaming services, um, the new wave of dedicated channel groups, like the folks over at AMC, for example, uh, you know, being able to provide these insights to your clients and let them know that this isn't just a plan you're thinking of for the next three months. This is the next six months, the next year. It, it's, it's important. You know, we've seen a lot of streaming services launched in the past year. A lot of folks are getting fatigued from having to subscribe to 15 different services. And because of this, the growth of ad supported formats is massive. Uh, you know, folks like Hulu and Peacock are seeing their subscriptions where they're not charging people in order to access their content skyrocket. But simultaneously, this provides advertisers like yourselves and some of the brands you work with an opportunity because now folks, unlike say the YouTube experience where you know you skip the ad or you might walk away because you know you haven't quite heard your Beyonce jingle playing just yet. You know, these are moments in the middle of episodes. These are moments where people are already captivated that they've now accepted because it is the basis of them not having to pay a subscription that ads are going to be part of the experience. Uh, you know, it's less likely to feel intrusive and it's also a lot less likely that they're going to feel that they're being bombarded left and right because they've chosen to go down this pathway. Yeah, I think something else to keep an eye on for CTV as it continues to grow is people are chasing the ACR data pretty, pretty heavily right now. Like Amazon even announced they're gonna be building in their own smart TVs and Fire TV is already like built into Insignia and like Toshiba, for example. But it's it's definitely something that's been a quality data set and something you should consider for future campaigns. Um, but it seems like each TV provider or streaming provider is trying to figure out their own way to capture that data and leverage it for programmatic targeting. All right, pivoting in digital audio. Oops, there we go. So I think it's important just to talk about where the subscription market is right now. Um, I think audio is lagging a little bit behind CTV just because of the way that people tune into audio, right? Like not always does it have your undivided attention. Like I'm a Spotify subscriber and I listen to music all the time and it's typically minimized on my desktop while I'm working. Something else to consider here as well is like a lot of these subscription services, you know, Spotify, for example, again, don't have like a cheaper version that's ad supported. So you do have to be considering, you know, what format and who you're reaching, who isn't a subscriber when you're considering audio as part of your programmatic media buy. 
Um, but again, I don't want you to undervalue it because it is an, another way to engage people in a different format that can lead to brand awareness, brand consideration, et cetera. Again, we're seeing this grow over time. Um, again, I think this is just starting to win over traditional radio, for example, especially if commuter bases have decreased year over year with people switching to a work from home lifestyle. Uh, that's when I typically tuned into the radio if I was commuting. Um, but again, I, th I think these things are changing and people are starting to pivot towards not being engaged when driving and then also just paying for the subscription itself. Cool. Wonderful. So I think it's really important to touch on ad fatigue, right? Um, speaking from somebody like in the advertising industry, like I enjoy watching ad supported content. Like I'll, I'll go to YouTube, I'll go to Hulu and I'll try and find new advertisers that are spending in streaming services or spending in CTV. That said, I think that there is a few issues that some people need to be aware of when it comes to ad fatigue. I think we've all seen, especially if you're watching something late at night, like I was watching a 30 minute show and there was about nine minutes of ad breaks in that 30 minute show. So it honestly became unbearable even for me and I'm in the space and I immediately went and signed up for like the premium version of that subscription service. So it's something to consider. And the nice thing about CTV or any of these formats with a programmatic channel is you have the, the flexibility to control the frequency that you're reaching people at. Right, you can always see the effects of, okay, if, if we have a frequency of five versus a frequency of seven, what did that do towards customer sentiment if you're running a brand lift? Or you can also see like, what did that do to my conversion rate? Did it increase or decrease? But again, it's something that you really wanna be cognizant of because people are really, you know, they're, they're hit with ads almost everywhere they go these days. So just make sure you have you have fresh creative and you're not, you know, bombarding them with uh, too much of your creative or with a specific brand. This is definitely a moment where that, the, the importance of the creative rotation really comes into play. You know, understanding that everyone's been in their homes and to date the traditional mindset of an advertiser is making sure, you know, you're hitting certain frequencies for your impressions. So, you know, while we want to follow those metrics and that, you know, kind of time tested trend of how to do things, it's also important to note that people aren't getting the same breaks from seeing your brand. They're not getting to go and maybe see an advertisement on say a bus or a billboard or anything else. Everyone's getting the same reception through their screens. Most majority leave their phones and their computers. So understanding that the need to make sure you're not numbing someone out to your ads, that they're not receiving the, the CTAs you're wanting to push purely because they've been bombarded with it too many times is something that really should be stressed to your clients right now. Yeah, and this this will definitely go into the next slide, which is, I, I think, you know, with the way that the industry has evolved, like performance and looking at data has, has definitely taken most of the evaluation and criteria for seeing if a programmatic campaign is successful. And realistically, I think that's going to change in 2023 as traditional attribution also changes. And having a strong creative is really what's going to set you out from the competition or even other agency partners. And it's something that I think that the industry itself has overlooked. And, you know, I'm even guilty of it, too, where we have a great audience, a great campaign set up. And then the creative itself, I don't think might warrant the campaign or even the brand. And, and that's something that we need to consider, right? Going back to the points that we've been making, people have multiple screens. So whether that be you know, me on my phone, me on my desktop, or me even watching TV in the background, the way that you stand out and the way that you maximize the effect of your advertising campaigns is making sure that that creative resonates and it captures their attention, right? Like, I think a great example of this, and I know Kevin gave the general shout out to, you know, having too many ads in a specific segment. I think Geico and even some of these insurance brands, they hit you very consistently, but they have an, a great amount of creative where it still seems fresh and I'm not sick of seeing it, right? It stands out. And I think that's something that we all need to take and factor in as we go into 2022 and 2023 is how can we make the creative really resonate with audiences and break through all of the noise that is really stemmed from us working from home and using multiple devices. You touch on this too, utilizing partners in the space, partners that have 
the creative capability background partners that will work with you on making sure you're also a b testing some of your own creative you know we i, I love the geico example there pierce i'm a big fan of that one state farm because i feel like between you know uh, my social media snapchat and my you know some of the ads i see on my phone or my laptop uh, i'm always getting something different it, it still drives me the same cta i still recognize it as those brands but I, I feel like either I'm being told a more comprehensive narrative or bare minimum, I'm, I'm just not seeing the same, you know, face pop up for 10 seconds every time. And so with that, you know, have these conversations with your clients, ask them, you know, are there new creatives you, you'd like to test? Have you considered going forward with this campaign to initially test at least, you know, two variations of creatives and maybe there's a, a two week check in point during the campaign where based off of performance, you decide on which one you'll move forward with. But having variance is definitely important in today's market where oversaturation is a strong issue. Yeah, I think that's well said, right? I think that's probably why Progressive 2 switched away from Flow and started enjoy, uh, putting Jimmy into more creative and more commercials just because they don't want to have that same repetition and it gives you a different way to resonate with the brand. I love Great. Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So I think a big thing, and contextual, you know, a lot of people claim to have it, um, whether or not that's, you know, real contextual advertising or some kind of mass obscurity that they're presenting is, is really something that you need to dive into. But contextual targeting is going to be massive here coming in 2022 and 23. Okay. So I think it's really important for us to acknowledge that, you know, third party cookies going away is going to potentially hinder targeting in, in the upfront until we get something that's more um, accepted by not only consumers, but also the industry. And I think it's a really unique opportunity for people to start pushing their own first party sources. Right. And I've seen a few brands do this, but realistically, I think it's always good, like if people are engaging with the website or you know that you have a strong case to build a mobile app for a client, those are all great first party sources. Like we should be making the most, most of the effort to capture first party data, whether that be name, address, phone number, email address, right? All of that will pay dividends when you know the industry does officially shift towards this first party data set and it gives you the ability to target people um, when we might not have a specific solution in place, when things do end up changing. Okay. It's important to also think about, you know, while it may not have been a primary focus of campaigns in the past, you, you don't want to have to address this issue after the cookie disappears. You want to have these resources planned ahead of time. So considering adding uh, maybe an earlier stage in your conversion process with a focus on driving email signups, that then you retarget from there for the actual conversion you're looking for, or working with some of your clients and brands on identifying, you know, did they attend trade shows in the past that provided email lists? Are there collections that their experiential teams have done that you can utilize to better optimize your campaigns? You know, in the current day and age, the first party data is only going to help supplement, but more importantly, in the future, it's going to be a really important cornerstone of the performance of your campaigns when the cookie isn't the thing that you can anchor to. And while there's obviously alternatives to that, you know, it's still important to start building up those resources now rather than trying to address them after the fact. Yeah, well said. I think a tangible example of this is I've seen a lot of e-commerce clients, like when I first land on their page and dwell there for five to 10 seconds, they'll have a pop-up with a discount code. And all I have to do is put in my email address super easy client wins customer wins etc and we can still you know we can start building that repository of first party data now and it'll set you up so so well for the future changes perfect so you know contextual i think is the biggest biggest importance here in terms of targeting i think it's one of the biggest targeting options online um, for as a replacement for like the third party cookie currently and you know i'm experienced with how we leverage contextual advertising like we are looking specifically at you know what the article is that person is reading and then we're bidding on that article in real time it's a great way to win you know that first consideration right like for example if i'm reading for a food recipe that i want to cook with my wife over the weekend 
and I'm being hit with an advertisement that makes sense for that article, whether it be, you know, a seasoning or a topic or even like Instacart, for example, that hey, helps me get my groceries, you know, faster and I don't have to leave my house. Like this is something that we have sound, seen incredible import performance on and something that if you haven't tested yet, now is definitely the time to do so because I think this will be in the interim, probably one of the best targeting solutions we have when the cookie does disappear. Well said, Pierce. And it's important to note, you know, some of the things we've touched on earlier in, in this, whether it be that, you know, need for additional creator rotation or the ad fatigue or the concerns around people kind of drowning in this bubble that we've surrounded them in. You know, this is a solution that targets problems that people are looking to solve rather than assuming that you know what the end user wants. So you know, not only does this help with your conversions, it helps with your click-through rates, but it really lets you have the experience either uh, with your brand or with your client that allows the end user to correlate a positive experience. They're not being followed around as they might feel with some of their other campaigns. You know, you're, you're really getting to narrow down on providing solutions to people rather than targeting just specific pages. Yeah, and I think it also offers like a level of granularity to reporting. Like I know that's something that we deal with from time to time of like, where is my impression going? And I don't think you can get any more granular than knowing specifically the article you're advertising on in relation to your audience. So that's something as well that's really, really nice about this format. I know, Pierce, you even mentioned earlier, you know, when we were talking about some of the, the targeting limitations that are starting to come out from other areas, you know, I think it's also important to note that, you know, contextual allows you to, to have the same sense as targeting as you might with a normal campaign, but in situations where it may not be possible, whether it's, you know, providing solutions to people that are looking for medicine for certain medical disorders or interacting with certain political or special interest groups, you know, being able to focus on where they're looking for answers rather than trying to assume the bubble that they need to be put in. Um, can still give you insights that you wouldn't gain otherwise. A great, great point. I think it's this will be really important for, you know, things that might be more sensitive in terms of targeting, right? Like there's obviously protected classes, but you can always do things related to symptom targeting that's super unique. And I know Kevin and I have leveraged that before in our own campaigns and seen great performance. So, perfect. Moving on, in-game ads. So I think we all know gaming is becoming really, really big in the industry at this point in time. We can just see that from Microsoft's frequent, uh, recent acquisitions, but this opens up quite a lot of targeting opportunities. Um, and I'll kick this over to Kevin because I know he has a lot to talk about when it comes to gaming. I appreciate it, Pierce. Uh, no, I mean, in-game advertising has been a, an area of focus for years of mine, um, all the way from uh, working with you know, this small indie startup company called Tencent. Uh, you know, it's been a focus because as we're seeing growth in the gaming industry, uh, especially here in the U.S. market, where you know some of the other markets overseas have been adapting for a long time now, the biggest growth opportunity has definitely been in mobile gaming. Um, the reason being, you know, whether you're playing the new Fortnite uh, game mode or you're, say, maybe dropping in on Warzone, uh, these interactions are built specifically for high-paced dopamine injected short content opportunities and what i mean by this is you know if you're playing say a normal video game like uh, a madden or you know uh, a fortnite on console these, these games may go on for extended periods of time they they could be elongated so that way the focus is more predominantly on the gameplay experience but for these mobile games the the main focus is to make this a short and sweet content suit that you can hop in and hop out of at leisure whether it's on your way to work in the morning, while you're waiting for your pizza to pop out of the oven at Domino's, whatever it may be, reaching this audience in a way that shows them that you're not only engaged with what they're working with, but you understand them is extremely important. This is an audience that thrives off authenticity. So uh, while you can see our graph here from YouGov that does address that about half of people haven't been influenced based off of an in-game ad, the other half have. And the important thing to note about that is that audience, if they are converted, are 10 times more loyal. They, they, they buy in so much more quickly because of authenticity and more importantly, matching their needs being strongly reflected in this space. 
Yeah, I think that's that's a great point. And I think like the growth of mobile gaming is is coming from honestly smartphone penetration. Like realistically, if you don't have a smartphone these days, I don't, I don't know what phone you're even using. But that makes this so much more of an addressable market and something that you can actually leverage to you know reach specific and niche audiences. The one call out that I'll make with in-game advertising, and I don't know if anyone's downloaded one of those like free games before, but be cognizant of how you're advertising to gamers, right? Like if you're doing something that has more of like a pop-up environment um, that might frustrate your audiences. So again, going back to authenticity, like just make sure it's a friendly format, something that gamers won't be annoyed with, because again, the whole point of playing the game is to play the game and not specifically see your advertising. It's important to note here too, the, the quality control of the inventory too, whether working with a partner or a strategist that knows the space, um, you know, the perception of one seeing your brand's ad and maybe the words with friends app versus seeing a, a banner in the background of like nitro racing can provide a, its own, you know, kind of legitimacy boost, so to speak. You, you would want to make sure that you're, you're associating with games that are only content relevant but also of a quality that, that matches the product you're trying to ship. You know, my, my favorite example being, as you can see here, uh, the one of the big plushies that, you know, kind of gives you the angry face and you flip it upside down, it's a smiley face. Um, you know, that's what we would call kind of a lower price point item. So you could see that in games that maybe are flash or browser based. But if you're, you're trying to sell a $300 headset, you, you might want to focus more on some, say some of these Warzone opportunities or Fortnite or some of these other games that have a, a higher household income associated with them as well. Yeah, it's definitely important to make sure your your product meets, meets the audience or matches the audience you're trying to advertise to, for sure. Perfect. So the oh. metaverse is here. <laughs> oh, that's oh, one of my favorite ones. One of my favorite ones. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, I was just going to say, I'm still trying to figure out if this is a fad or not a fad, right? Like. I think that this can be very valuable for brands to some degree, um, but I do think that this is something that's definitely in the future state, right? If we go back to the talc that I was talking about, that, that graph, I don't think this has been fully adopted yet. And I do think that there's gonna be a barrier to entry to the metaverse, right? Like you can access it through your phone, you can access through a computer or a gaming console, but realistically the best experience is probably gonna come from a VR headset and those, you know, are $300 plus. So just something to keep in mind, you know, it's up to you and your discretion if you think this would be worth investing in for one of your clients, but I still think it's very nascent in terms of a product and advertising space. So just something to keep in mind, um, you also have to kind of filter through all the fluff pieces that are on it, right, to, to understand if this is gonna be a good investment for your brand since everyone likes to put out some, you know, PR press release about the metaverse, it gets them in the news cycle. But that doesn't mean that it's going to be a great investment for X brand. I think it'll be important going into this year and next year to, to really, if you're going to engage your clients in conversations about the metaverse, um, understand a few basic things. You know, the first and foremost, I would say most important for everyone here, Facebook, aka Meta, is not the metaverse. As much as they're trying to buy their way into that association, um, there, there is no centralized universe quite yet for this. It's why you're seeing companies like Roblox who, you know, as we've addressed here, have a Ralph Lauren exhibition, but also did an entire fashion show, Gucci Louis Vuitton, last year's part of Fashion Week. You know, the significance here is being able to blend both the uh, in-game placement of these brands and the experiential element that the game itself facilitates for the user and exposing an audience in a way that when they do see your ads later on down the road, uh, or maybe they're in the wild and they're looking up stuff for the game on game guides. It, this is part of a full funnel approach. You don't wanna just go in and buy a piece that you need to make sure you get in there. You wanna actually have it facilitated in a way where people are able to associate it back to your brand with a positive experience. Yeah, well said. Um, and again, I think like this trend is definitely just starting to pick up. I think with like the creator economy that's coming around and all the streamers and people in YouTube gaming, like this is definitely going to be something that we need to keep an eye on as an industry. Um, I think Fortnite, honestly, like even though it's been kind of portrayed as a kid's game, I think they've done a great job of like ex experiential marketing, especially with like the Marvel movie releases. I remember when uh, Endgame came out, they had you running around trying to play as Thanos and like that was a fantastic way to build hype. They did something similar with Spider-Man in the most recent release. 
So if you have the budgets and it makes sense, like this is definitely something to consider or recommend to a client. But again, I think it's still nascent and something that you should maybe stay away from if like you don't see a specific fit for a client with this audience. Cool. Blockchains and NFTs. Yes, blockchain is here. Web3 is here. But when? So I'll touch on this briefly. I mean, I think, again, going to talking about nascent industries, like blockchain is definitely something that I, I don't think the industry or even a lot of people within the space know where the potential in the future is going to go with this. But we are seeing a lot of you know money come out of specific crypto exchanges. So if you look at crypto.com, like that one is huge. They just partnered with a stadium. They're spending a ton of money with Matt Damon for advertising. FTX is another one that's using Tom Brady and they're spending in the Super Bowl this year. I do expect Coinbase as well to start advertising. They just signed the Martin agency um, as of last year. So there is money involved here, right? If you're looking to land new clients for the agency, and you want people with you know significant budgets, maybe this is something to look forward to. But again, in terms of the future outlook, we don't necessarily know how it's going to impact our industry. Cool. Oh, so, for, yeah, I'll, I'll let you kick this one off, Kevin, and then I'll, I'll chime in at the end. So the, this admittedly is one, one of the areas that I, I enjoy nerding out about. Um, the, the big focus here that, you know, with NFTs, uh, you have the greatest opportunity for collaboration. And what this means for your clients and yourself as advertisers is, you know, a lot of the times in the space right now, you know, it's not just one brand pushing their sole focus, the brands, you know, collaborating with uh, maybe a fashion brand and entertainment brand or a music brand and a tech brand. And the opportunity for cross-pollination of audiences is immense. Not only is this driving large-scale social engagement, uh, this is pushing into new technological areas like growing Discord communities, for example. Um, but it's really hitting, especially the Gen Z area at home, because they're seeing these large scale brands that to date have just been names and faces. And you know, maybe they'll have some of the shoes or the fashion stuff that goes with it. But being able to legitimately invest in the future growth of a brand, but in a way that allows you to tap into your creative artistic side is super important. It's shown as been a highly addressable area for this age group, and it taps into what we talked about earlier on that authenticity. It's extremely hard to, to just kind of cheaply throw together an NFT. There's a lot of thought and creativity has to go into it, and just right out the gate, it creates amazing assets for advertising campaigns as well. Yeah, I think just to touch on this briefly, like something that's really unique about NFTs, especially like Coca-Cola is on the screen here. It can give you another channel or product to sell for programmatic campaigns, like specifically for Coca-Cola, it's typically CPG. So like online sales might not be something they've been able to delve into too much, or it's not the majority of their rev share. So that's something to consider. Also, it could be unique with as we approach like a supply chain restricted environment this year um, to create an NFT that still helps the brand drive revenue. But again, I still think it's brand new. So just be cognizant that this is an option, but maybe or maybe not, you should invest in it. The big thing to note here is, is the opportunity it provides also for agencies like yourselves. There, believe it or not, there are entire agencies dedicated now to NFT project growth, their adoption in the mass market, um, to the biggest ones in the space, both Coinbound and the X10 agency. Even uh, I've started blending in some influencer marketing as well as a new channel of growth called Discord growth. Um, for those of you not familiar, uh, Discord is a online communication server platform that allows facilitations of communities in large cell groups to exist in one central conversation point. Um, growth of these communities is really important in this space because a lot of NFT launches, coin launches, um, collaboration projects that drive growth all take place first in this new environment that provides almost an early access to limited drops or uh, access to new product teasers coming up. If you're working with NFT or crypto clients in the space and they haven't addressed their community management and Discord server strategies with you, that should be your first question to them the next meeting you have. Wonderful, perfect. So now we're going to pivot a little bit into just talking about some of our solutions for the space, then we'll go into Q&A time. 
So I think first and foremost, like we've been talking about how attribution is shifting and third-party cookie is going away. For, for Stack App specifically, you know, since our inception, we've never been dependent upon the third-party cookie. We've always used like device ID and residential IP as an anchor. And this allows you to create some really unique advertising campaigns from a multi-channel multi approach. Like we can hit a family or a household on CTV and then retarget them within the same household on different devices. So that again goes back to the frequency you're reaching people at, being able to have it resonate. And then again, capturing their attention since you're not hitting them on one specific screen. To Chris's point, I think it's also important to note that if you wanna make sure you're servicing your client in the best way possible, whether it comes to frequency control, which is something generally provided by uh, folks like ourselves at the DSP level or targeting the right audience, to do so, you really need to understand the effectiveness of your reach across multiple channels, which means working with a partner that can handle the multiple channels that come with that, whether that be being able to retarget based off of completed views of CTV with display native ads, or maybe your programmatic uh, audio campaigns, or you know potentially someday in the future, cough, cough, keep your eyes peeled, uh, being able to utilize digital out of home campaigns all in one stop shop that provides the reporting back to you that keeps your campaign succinct, but gives you insightful optimizations for your end client as well. Wonderful, perfect. And I know we were touching on CTV specifically, so this is just our approach to the marketplace. Like we've seen a lot of success with CTV from integrated campaigns, right? Use that for some brand awareness. And then we trickle that into like mid funnel and lower funnel approaches just to drive, you know, people from the top down of the funnel all the way into consideration and even purchasing phases. So I think this is definitely something you can start including with a lot of your pro, uh, proposals, even if it's specifically DR, like nobody buys a brand they've never heard about. So again, something I would recommend including any future proposals for this year. Same thing goes for programmatic audio, right? Different format that you can reach people on. We have pre-roll, mid-roll and post-roll. I think it's really unique to try and get people, you know, to listen when they are listening to music, whether that be working out or something along those lines to engage with your brand, understand about your brand and, and consider you for whatever they might be considering in the future, whether it be purchase, awareness, or even down the road. We know a lot of financial and B2B clients use this specifically with us just to make sure they're they're reaching their you know high profile audiences or specific audiences across multiple channels, just to make sure that it's resonating with them and they're aware that their brand is around. Perfect. You know, I think we, I think we beat contextual targeting up pretty pretty well already, um, but realistically, like we're seeing contextual targeting outperform retargeting in certain situations, right? So the devil comes to the detail when it comes to contextual targeting and the actual keywords you choose for these. But we just released French and Spanish targeting, which we're really excited about. But again, this is one of my favorite targeting techniques, and we can use it for you know awareness or even direct response campaigns. Cool. So wrapping up, here are our key takeaways. You know, hopefully this was interesting for everybody and we covered on a lot of things that the market is facing currently. I highly rec recommend using multiple channels to drive performance for your clients. Um, CTV, audio are definitely the ones we covered today that I think would make a smart fit in any proposals or recommendations. And then, you know, it does help to have everything underneath one roof. Uh, I know the nice thing about our campaigns is they're all talking to each other and optimized together which no other providers in the space can't do, and really just helps with the bottom line KPI metrics and ensuring that there's you know, an outcome that's favorable for the agency and for your client. And if you're interested in the effectiveness of a multi-channel campaign, feel free, reach out to our inbound demo requests channel or to your Stack Adapt dedicated rep if you have one and ask them, you know, what would it look like if I added the video to my display native or maybe programmatic audio? You know, the ability and effectiveness of that multi-channel is something that we'd love to have a conversation with you about. Yeah. Wonderful. We try to save five minutes for Q&A and I will kick it back over to Amanda to kind of help us field some questions. Thanks so much, Kevin and Pierce, for your great presentation. Really great things to look forward to this year. So we'd now like to jump into the Q&A portion of the webinar. So a quick reminder, if you have any questions, please place them in the questions box. We have a healthy list here to go through. So we only have about five minutes left, so we'll try and tackle as many as we can. So first question here, um, 
what's the best way to control frequency on CTV? Would it be through the provider? Um, you know, personally, I think most providers in the space for CTV should be able to do it. But the nice thing about leveraging a DSP like ourselves is you have the ability to control frequency across multiple campaigns, whether that be CTV, native display, et cetera. We can actually set a frequency cap on the campaign group overarching all of the campaigns. So I think that's something to consider. Again, you don't want to get into the, the realm of duplicative reach or wasting impressions in media spend. So I would probably recommend a DSP in that situation in comparison to going to the specific provider. To that point to being able to optimize and adjust that frequency cap either to increase or decrease based off of campaign performance is important. And that's something that all account managers and AEs that work with us at Sack it Up are constantly checking and communicating back to our clients. So if you have questions, once again, about that, please reach out to us or reach out to your dedicated rep and they'll gladly sit down and have a conversation with you about that. Perfect. All right, next question here. Uh, what are your thoughts on accidental clicks in mobile games? Historically, we've shied away from any placements in mobile ads because it always seemed to be accidental clicks. Uh, how do we ensure that those mobile game ads are actually effective? I think it's important to note that, you know, when scrolling, scrolling on a phone, I think we've all had the fat finger moment. Uh, I think reading a news article at least once a week, I probably accidentally click on a native ad in the process just to where my thumb is. So understanding that in a mobile environment, those accidental clicks are, are definitely gonna happen. Um, but in specifically the mobile gaming environment, there are opportunities where these can be uh, rewarded video or opportunities where the placement is based off of games that you know have a higher engagement rate. I would say if you're looking to curb that, um, I would even take it a step back and focus on your targeting. You know, as someone that accidentally clicks on ads, I can tell you there's some I still actually go through and interact with afterwards because it was an ad that was served to me that was targeted and relevant, um, which is something that you can definitely address with a campaign manager or one of the folks here at Stack It Up. Yeah, I think too is like looking outside of just the click, right? Like I know that's an important metric for in-app, but look at, you know, dwell time or engagement on the site itself. Like if somebody's bouncing consistently, okay, maybe consider, you know, what advertisement placement placement is leading to that. And like the nice thing about Stack It App is we're inventory agnostic. So if we consistently saw that one of our managed campaigns, we probably pause that inventory source and optimize the ones that are performing better. Perfect. And I have another question here on frequency. Uh, what's a good frequency cap for display and video games? And should it be set at the campaign group level or at the general campaign level? Um, I think it's going to differ. Uh, I, I would definitely lean into, once again, what your, your target audience is. Um, for example, you know, RPG players uh, are going to be more methodical strategy based thinkers. They're going to be able to probably associate value prop analysis a lot better on their time and resource management skills versus if you're exposing yourself to an FBS audience. You know, um, <laughs> I'd argue that they're probably more accidental clickers as well because they're speeding through. It's, uh, you know, you have adrenaline rushing, dopamine's flooding your system. You're bouncing between three to five minute long matches. So just keeping in mind the audience that you're looking to look at. Um, but frequency wise, I I'd recommend between the, the five to seven range um, simply because that has been the date kind of golden rule. But more importantly, look at the data you're being provided. If you're seeing that that audience isn't as engaging much, maybe you do need to adjust that. And that's something that comes with just live optimizations on a frequent basis. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kevin and Pierce. So I think that wraps it up for today. Uh, so I'd like to thank you all for attending today. We hope you found it both informative and insightful. We'll be sending out a follow-up email with a recording to all registrants. Please don't hesitate to reach out with any other questions you might have. I'd like to thank you again for joining us, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful day, everyone.